Welcome, everybody. It's Ted Pedromo, and I have a very special guest today, Michael Port. And gosh, it was like 2001 or so I came across you, I think, 2002. I had just finished my 20-year career in high tech, and I was transitioning to be a coach. And I had no idea how to market or sell, and like nobody would hire me. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> Don't you hate how that happens? So I just, your book came out. And I just say you've changed my life. I took some of your online courses. Yeah. How to, yeah, it was just amazing. So tell us a little about you. You're an actor. You've written oh, six no, bestsellers. No, no. I, I was an actor at one point <laughs> in my earlier career, but, I, uh, but a professional actor. I have a master's from NYU, the graduate acting program. And then I went out and I worked and I was on shows like Sex in the City, Third Watch, All My Children, Law and Order, 100 Center Street. I did films like... The Pelican Brief, Down to Earth, Last Call, The Believer. But I did dozens, if not hundreds, of voiceovers for brands like AT&T, Coors Beer, Budweiser, Pizza Hut, Braun, wow. MTV. I used to do the Box Music Network. All music, all the yeah. time. Unfortunately, none of uh, these uh, brands are sponsoring this blab, but maybe we can get them too. There we go. Yeah. So that was, that was in the early days. And then I left uh, acting and I went into business and I talked my way into a job in middle management in the fitness industry on the business side for which I was completely unqualified. Mm -hmm. I told them I was unqualified, uh, but I made my case for why they should hire me. And I did okay. And then five years later, I went out on my own, started a consultancy, first uh, focused on that target market, the fitness industry, and then grew from there and then book yourself solid came out and that was it that just that just hit and i got really lucky and been growing from there and that was 10 years ago yes so now i've written steal the show which is all about how to shine during life stake life's high stakes situations so about half of it is a tour de force on public speaking itself mm -hmm deep, deep into technique on public speaking. But the, the other half is really focused on everyday situations that are important. Interviews, negotiations, sales pitches, even meeting your future in-laws for the first time mm -hmm. has an element of performance. Now, the key is authentic performance. Because, Ted, you know, sometimes when, when I use the word performance, people think, oh, well... Performing is fake. It's phony. It's pretend. Right. It absolutely can be, for sure. I think there are a lot of people who put on layers of persona and you know, pretend to be something that they're not. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about taking your individualism, your natural disposition, your personality, your style, and amplifying it so that you can steal the show during those high-stakes situations. That's our focus. That's what I love about it. It's not just presenting from the stage, being a great speaker. You're talking about real life interactions with people. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. Now I'm, I'm looking at myself and I just want to say for all of our, um, our viewers here, normally, I mean, we have an audio studio in the house. And we have a video studio in the house. Uh, I'm in the audio studio right now, which is not designed for video. So I look like a raccoon, these big circles under my eyes. I have very deep set eyes. I look like a Cro-Magnum man. I don't know if you noticed that. <laughs> So uh, I have to be have to be lit from underneath. Anyhow, so that's You're why like the, not the best screen in the world because you know very important. You know I'm teaching people performance that the that the background uh, looks good and it's you know set up well. But uh, hey, nonetheless, authentic. Come on, uh, totally no. But authentic can be nice looking. You know it doesn't have to be. <laughs> so that's what's interesting about uh, the world of social media. I think sometimes sometimes authenticity is is painted we paint a picture that authenticity is grunginess that that it that everything has to look you know like messy and nasty and that's uh, that's authentic like we have to have ripped up you know stained shirts when we're giving speeches at social media conferences and i i like to you know put on a um a nicer cleaner face Right. So, you know, it's it's your own brand, each person, individual, et cetera. And, and for me personally, I generally like to shave um, <laughs> you know, before I, I get on the TV in any event. So I'm just I'm just so happy we're doing this. 
so I read your copy of Steal the Show already. I got my Kindle version. Great. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. So you talk about like when you're getting on stage, like how do you capture the crowd right away? Well, or even in person, actually more importantly, in face to face with one on one. Sure. Well, look, let's let's just use let's talk about marketing for a second, because this is an area of expertise for you. If I could take the word marketing out of the dictionary, I'd love to. I'd love to. And I'd replace it with the word relevancy. Because ultimately, people pay attention to you when you're relevant. If you're not relevant, there's no reason for them to pay attention. But if you're relevant, then they do. So whether it's a speech or a conversation with one person uh, or something you're putting on social, relevancy is what's most important. So that's, that's first and foremost. Now, many of the articles you will see on public speaking will tell you to start off with a story or a joke. Right. Now, let's talk about this for a second. If you're not a comedian, I'm not sure starting off with a joke is a great strategy. If you're, if you're very, very, very funny, like you just have a natural funny bone, your timing is impeccable, well, then maybe uh, uh, a joke will work for you. But you want to make sure that you know it lands every time, number one. And it needs to be relevant to the subject at hand. Yeah. A joke about something that has nothing to do with what you're there to deliver is not relevant. And then it might be a little bit funny, but they're like, come on, let's go. I got, I got, I got stuff to do. I'm here to learn something specific. Number one, number two stories, of course, are incredibly important uh, devices for connecting with people. And we understand, we know that this is a, it's a communication tool that works well. Yeah. Yeah. If we start a speech with a story, it's got to kill. It's got to be an outstanding story and it has got to be directly related to the big idea behind the speech and helps deliver on the promise of the speech. Yeah. Again, it's the relevancy that's key. And if you want, uh, at some point in this interview, we can talk about how to craft stories mm -hmm. because just because something happened to you doesn't mean it's easy to tell it on stage in front of others. So we need to sculpt it, craft it, mold it. And I have a process for doing that. Sometimes the easiest way to start a speech is just fluidly, easily moving into it, as opposed to trying to make it some massive deal with fireworks and explosions. Yeah. And if that's not your style, then you don't need to do that. And... There are keynotes that I give where I have unusual openings. So in the Think Big Revolution keynote, keynote that I do, uh, I open by starting very right with the audience and about a sentence into my start, my phone rings in my pocket. <laughs> now, the phone is actually coming out of the speakers. So very quickly, they're looking at what, huh? And then I say, you just give me a second. I'm so sorry. Let me answer this, okay? And I pick <laughs> And of course, now they know that this is a bit. Yeah. So I have a conversation with somebody on the phone and they are railing against me because I didn't deliver on a promise. Right. And that's the opening. And A, it's a nice way to be self-deprecating. Mm -hmm. And B, it's a nice way to show them this idea of the importance of making commitments and excuse me, and fulfilling them yeah. rather than just tell them. Because I could come out and say, listen, everybody, I am a very important speaker. Yeah. And you know, that's, that's something else. So this way it becomes a show. So that's an unusual opening. But that's not necessary. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, uh, say for a Book Yourself Solid speech, I'll come out and I'll just start. I'll say, look, Book Yourself Solid is based on both philosophical and practical principles. And then I'll go into it. And they're like, mm -hmm. okay, that was a nice, smooth transition. The other thing is, I'm, I'm getting a little feedback uh, background. Maybe it's uh, yours, your speakers are coming back into the headset. Um, sometimes uh, the way a speech works is there's usually an arc. Yeah. So that it starts here and it builds and it builds just like a movie. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And if you start here, there's nowhere to go. 
And so the audience needs to connect with you. At the beginning, they have to get used to you. They, just like, you know how it's amazing when you hear a parent talk to their three-year-old and they understand exactly what that three-year-old is saying? And the three-year-old mm-hmm. sounds to us like they're, now going to be that, i be like, what that? But the parent is so used to that child, they know exactly what they're saying. Yeah. Sometimes the audience uh, relates to us that way. At the beginning, they start to hear us and it's wah, 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 because yeah. they're not used to our patterns, our rhythms, our, you know, our dynamic, and they need to get used to us. So that, that very smooth, fluid, easy way of getting into a speech is perfectly fine. That's great advice. Because some people come out, they put those big videos up now, the self-promotional videos. Yes, One yes. of the greatest. Exactly. So, so here's one of the things that you can do. Interestingly enough, the bio is, is more important than I think people realize when you're being introduced. Because your speech starts before you walk on the stage. It starts as soon as that person introduces you. So your bio should be Mm well-crafted. And generally, the shorter the bio, the higher status you are. For example, if Bill Gates is speaking at a conference, we don't really need a bio. We just say, ladies and gentlemen, Bill Gates. And that's it. Ladies and gentlemen, Warren Buffett. We don't need to know all the companies that he's purchased over the years. That's it. So the longer your bio, the more it looks like you are trying to improve something. Yeah. So the audience just needs to know that you know what they want to know, or you've done what they want to do. Mm -hmm. So if you have some very impressive uh, credentials that are relevant to that, great, put them in there. If there's something that you do that's in, in that's so unusual that it will make people go, hmm, then put that in there. But if it's, you know, uh, has a wife uh, and two kids and lives in Ohio, I don't really think people care right. about that. Most people have a couple kids and, you know, a spouse or an ex-spouse, you know, so it's, it's yeah. uh, not unusual. But if you have 10 children, that's unusual. People will go, what is, are they crazy? You know, yeah. that's then it, it's fun. In any event, what I, and, but here's the thing, even if your bio is well-crafted, the person reading it may not do a good job. Right. Because yeah. A, they may not really care that much. They could be a sponsor and they're there to pitch their business right. and just are, have been tasked with reading your bio. So it may go like this. Michael Porter's New York Times bestselling author of five books. And it's been called an outcome. You know, that's that's what they do. They yeah. don't necessarily perform it. So what I do is I have a slideshow that I advance during the bio. And then I rarely use slides otherwise. Right. I will use some uh, video and some images, and I use a lot of audio, uh, but I don't need slides to give a speech. But I do it during this part. So what they're seeing on screen mirrors what that person is saying. Right. Because if they're talking about, uh, you know, is seen on this TV show, this TV show, this TV show, if they see it, they believe it. If they hear it, they go, oh, maybe. But they don't really know what that meant. If they say, well, Michael Port was in Sex in the City and Third Watch and all my then they see pictures of me with Sarah Jessica Parker or Michael Paul or et cetera. And they go, oh, he actually did that. Yeah. So what I find is people will be on their phone when the bio starts. And as soon as those slides start going, they go, oh, and they'll watch them. Interesting. You see? And then what I often do, because I've written six books, it's a lot of books. Yeah. I will often come out and say, guys, I got a secret for you. And, but I need you to lean in because I want to whisper it. Just in case there are any other authors around, I don't want them to hear. Mm-hmm. And I'm playing with the other authors a little bit. Um, and they kind of go, hmm, what is he going to say? But I don't say anything that would upset them, of course, because we are a team, all of us. Yeah. Right. So I say, listen, but I, you, have to, you have to lean in. Um, and if anybody doesn't, I say, no, come on, even you, let's go. Come on, buddy. And I get everybody to lean in. I say, how can you tell how much BS exists in any one particular field or industry? And then I'll lean back and they all lean back. So all of a sudden, boom, the whole room is doing exactly yeah. what I'm doing. And I say, count the number of books written about it. 
and everybody laughs. Yeah. It's not a, whoa, ho, ho, not a laugh, that kind of laugh. It's a, oh, I get it. And I say then, and I've written six. Yeah. So what does that tell you? And then they laugh at that. And so what I'm doing is I'm poking a little fun, saying, look, I know that they, you know, they prayed us, they, pray, they, 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 they put us out here to be the experts, to tell you guys what to do. And I say, but I don't think there's any one way to do anything. I'm going to yeah. present a particular perspective, a particular experience, and you might resonate with it and you might not. Mm -hmm. Some things you resonate more with than others. And immediately it lets their guard down. Right. Because a lot of times the speaker will come out and tell them, this is what you have to do. This is the way to do it. You hear in speeches, you hear the word have to a lot. Yeah. And nobody has to do anything except pay taxes and die. <laughs> other than that, they don't have to. So when you're saying, well, you have to use this social platform or you have to do this, you have to do that. That's not true. So one of the things, another thing we want to stay away from, if possible, are absolutes. Because absolutes paint us in uh, to a corner. Mm -hmm. If I say everybody does this, yeah, people in the audience can go, well, I don't think that's true. I have a sister who does that or doesn't do that. Or if right. I said, I said, nobody likes earwax flavored ice cream. Somebody might say, all right, this is, this may be weird, but I remember Fritz in middle school used to put his fingers in his ear and eat it. I bet he would like you to wax flavored ice cream. You see, so if you give them absolutes, they have an excuse, they have an out. And here's what's really important, Ted. When you are introducing a big idea, it may be confronting to the people in the audience. Because you may be asking them to change something, change the way they think, change the way they feel, and change the way they behave. But they may have been thinking this, feeling this, acting this way for 30 years. And all of a sudden, you come along and say, listen, no, 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 I want you to think this way. Right. And, the, and, it's, and it's confronting. So it's very important that we don't put a, a wall between us by using absolutes, allow them the space to make their own decision with respect to whether or not they want to adopt your big idea. And to that end, they need to know that you understand the way the world looks to them. Yeah. Because if they don't, if they think, okay, I, I get your idea and I kind of want this promise, yeah. but I don't really think you get me, it's an easy out. Like, no, 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 you don't understand me. So the messenger and the message need to resonate with the person in the audience. If the message resonates, but the messenger doesn't resonate, then you have some discord. So do you adjust, like in your working through your talk, working through the arc, mm -hmm. do you adjust to the audience if they're not responding in certain ways? Yes. So what we're trying to do is find a balance between being prepared and being improvisational. And when those two are balanced, then we can be spontaneous and we can live in the moment. Many people are anxious about rehearsing. They say, I've rehearsed before and I don't really like it. I just feel better like when I go up there and I just talk to them, I feel more comfortable. When I rehearse, I feel stiff. And I really get that. I get that. I get that. I get that. And it might be a result of only rehearsing a little bit. Because if you rehearse a little bit and then go give a speech, what usually happens while you're giving the speech is you're trying to recall what you did in rehearsal and you're not in the moment. And then you feel stiff. Yeah. But if you are so well rehearsed that you don't have to think about what's coming next, you can allow it to come to you organically, authentically, and the audience will feel like it's the first time that you've ever said these things. And they make a connection with you as a result. I think many people, actually I know, this one I know, not everybody, but many people, because 
you know, we've worked now with thousands of people who speak on the amateur level and on the professional level, the highest level. And even they say, I don't really rehearse that much. And I say, well, are you as effective as you can be? And if they're in a group of people, they say, yeah, yeah of course. But if they're not, if they're in private, they go, you know what? Truth is not really. I know I could be a lot better, but mm-hmm. I don't know how to rehearse. And of course, why would they? They were never taught. I, you know, I have a, a master's from the grad program at NYU in acting. So I, I was trained in how to rehearse. So of course I know, but most people would never know that. You don't, right. That's not a course in business school. It's not a course in high school. It's certainly not a course in, uh, you know, agriculture school. So it's something we need to learn. And it's, I devoted a major section of Steal the Show to rehearsal specifically, because if we feel like we know how to rehearse, we feel a lot more comfortable on stage because people often ask, well, how do I get rid of anxiety nerves? That's, that's a really great question because people get mm. very anxious about public speaking. But I don't believe this statistic that people are more afraid of speaking than death. I, I don't know where it comes from because I've never seen an actual study, a verifiable empirical study. Because let me ask you a question, Ted. If I, had a, if I had a gun right now and I put it to somebody's head who was afraid of public speaking, I said, you have two options right now. You can give a speech to these people or I can pull the trigger and blow your head off. Which one do you think they're going to take? Blow my head off. No, they're not. They don't want to die. <laughs> no, I mean, I maybe know. some will, but they get, it's, because it's, it's this momentary thing. Like, would you really actually take a bullet in your head instead of giving a speech? Probably not. Yeah. And I think so we exacerbate this fear of public speaking as if it's this massive endeavor, this this situation that could make or break your entire life. Yeah. And, and then as a result, we go up there and we think, oh my God, I'm going to be ridiculed. I'm going to be, they're going to think I'm stupid. So we work ourselves up into a, a tizzy. And one of the best ways to reduce that anxiety is by knowing what you're doing when you're up there. Yeah. It would make sense, wouldn't it? Yeah. So then you feel a lot more comfortable. Just like if I have to, if I, if someone said, Michael, could you fly this airplane? I'd be really nervous because I've never done that before. Right. But if I had trained as a pilot in the Navy or in the Air Force and I had flown combat missions uh, all over the world and someone said, could you fly this plane? I'd say, of course I can fly that plane. I've been trained to fly that plane because we do not rise to the occasion. We fall back on our training. And this is what the military says. Right. Because if, 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 if someone gave me... Uh, you know, if someone said, okay, listen, I'm going to give you what you need uh, to, to fight in, uh, in combat in, our, in Afghanistan, but I'm not going to train you on how to use it. Mm-hmm. But I'm sure you'll rise to the occasion and figure out how to use the gun and all those things right. while the bullets are flying over your head. No, of course you won't. You're just going to duck and go like this. Yeah. A lot of, um, a lot of uh, war analogies. I apologize for that. But but I want, I use them in part because I want you to, I want to go to the extreme and demonstrate that on the grand scheme of things, giving a speech to people that are interested in listening to what you have to say is not the equivalent of imminent death. Right. So if you know what you're doing, then you feel a lot more comfortable on stage. Additionally, if you take the focus on yourself off, and you focus on the audience, you're much less, much less anxious. For example, a client of mine called me up a number of years ago, very, very anxious because she just got booked for an interview on one of the big news broadcast network morning shows. Huge. Now, mind you, she wanted this. She had gone to try to get it. Now she got it. She's freaking out, which is often interesting. I don't think I should go. I'm going to screw it up. I said, okay, just let's just relax. Let's just see what, you know, let's just focus on what's important. She says, okay, I just want to really know how to be good. I said, well, you cannot be good. It's not possible. Yeah. She was silent. I think she may have fallen off her chair. And I said, no, it's not that you're not good, but you can't go out there to be good. You can only go out there to be helpful. 
to make a promise to the audience and do your best to deliver on that. And that's it. That's your job. And if you do that, then people may perceive your performance as good. Oh, I really like their performance. But you're not worrying about yourself as much. You're not obsessed with your hair. See, I don't have to worry about that. That's the great thing about having no hair. Never have to worry about whether my just about to shine from the bulb on the top. Just for people who tuned in late, this is not my normal video studio. It's I'm kind of in a anyhow. Right. So um, you don't have to worry. About, you're not worried about your shirt or you know do my do my you know do my pants look make me look good or skinny or you're not worried about these things. You're just trying to help. That's all we're doing. You and I right now. We're just trying to help the people who are watching, doing our best, our absolute best to do it. We won't do it perfectly, but we will do our best. And that's that's all that you know we can ask for. Awesome. Yeah. Now, so think how about somebody that's just getting started. They're going to do their very first speech. Mm. Rehearse a lot? Or? Yes. Well, so, you know, you know, so we want to, uh, uh, as I said, there's a step-by-step a -step process to rehearsal. But before you go there, you need to actually create some content for the speech. And what most people normally do is they open up Keynote or PowerPoint and they download some images from Google and then they put them on the Keynote or the PowerPoint and then they put some quotes or phrases and then they work on their content around that PowerPoint or based on that PowerPoint as if the PowerPoint is the outline of the speech. Yeah. So I would suggest not doing that. The visuals that we use, we actually create after we create the content. Because those are just aids to help deliver on the promise. Mm -hmm. They're not the foundation of a speech. So to use PowerPoint or not to use PowerPoint has never been the question. It's, of course, how it's used. It's a benign tool. It's just how it's used. And right. often, you know, the clicker, Right. I think it shoots it shoots bullets and kills presentations. Right? The more you're clicking, you know, the more the focus is not on the performance, it's focused on the screen and yeah. you're not making connection with people. So what we want to do first before any of that is we want to want to make sure we're clear on our big idea. Yeah. So what's the big idea behind the speech? Because. There's got to be a real important reason to give this speech. But it doesn't have to be different to make a difference. Hmm. That's important. Often we question ourselves, especially at the beginning. We say, do I, who am I to say this thing? Or, you know, everything has been said before. You know, do, do, are people going to take me seriously on this particular topic, etc.? And then the voices of judgment start to take over. And you start yeah. to criticize yourself and that just stops you and you're like, I'm not going on. That's it. So think about Martin Luther King's, I have a dream speech. One of the greatest speeches of all time. Yeah. His big idea in that speech is that all men and women, of course, are created equal. It wasn't exactly a new idea. It's in the constitution. But it wasn't realized. Yeah. But he had a dream that it could be. And that's the promised land. And I think what's extraordinary about the promised land is the word promise. Because once you have the big idea, the next thing you look at is what's the promise of the presentation? Because that's what people want. They want that promise. Yeah. Yeah. And, of course, then your job is to deliver on that promise. So your big idea just needs to resonate with the people in the room, and you need to care deeply about it. Because often people will say, especially those who want to get into public speaking uh, professionally, they'll say, hey, listen, Michael, what's the hot topic? You know, like, what's, what's the thing that, like, makes the most money right now? And rarely will we be wildly successful yeah. putting together speeches based on topics that are hot that we're not passionate about. Exactly. And of course, if we're not passionate about, we probably don't have a lot of experience uh, in that area. Uh, so we're not looking for what's hot. We're looking for what's true for you and the people you serve. It's hard to be passionate if you're an authentic, if you really don't care about the topic. Yeah. I mean, you can look like, hey, what's up, guys? How are you? You know, you can, you can do some song and dance, but it ultimately won't be 
um, taken as truth. Because the truth to me wins. That's, that's what wins ultimately when you're performing. Honestly, truth, authenticity. So. Great. So we make sure the big idea is clear. Then we have a promise. Then we make sure that we can articulate, that we can demonstrate that we know how the world looks to the people in the room. We discussed that earlier. Then we make sure that we can articulate and demonstrate the consequences of not adopting this worldview or this behavior, whatever that big idea is. And that also we can demonstrate the rewards. Mm -hmm. Because we want the rewards, but sometimes the rewards seem far off. Yeah. And without the consequences to motivate us to get started, we may not go after those rewards. So it's like the hero's journey. Yes, absolutely. Yes. It's very similar. And ultimately, you're trying to cast each audience member as the hero. Right. Ultimately, that's what you're attempting to do. Um, but that's why if the speech is about us, if the focus is on us the entire time, then ultimately it's not. You can still tell your story. And sometimes your story is very compelling and the audience wants to hear that. But you tell it in such a way that they see themselves in it and you're telling it for them, not as catharsis for you. Right. Which often happens when people start speaking. They, I had a really intense experience or story. I want to be able to tell it in front of people uh, because it makes me feel better. But it's not a great reason uh, to speak publicly. You know, the catharsis should, should, should uh, happen somewhere else or as a byproduct of being in service of the audience, mm -hmm. not as the end goal. So once we have those five elements in place, then we can start to look at a framework because great speeches are well organized. Otherwise, they're talks. You see the difference? Yeah. So this is one of the reasons I suggest people stay away from starting a speech with, okay, today we're going to talk about this. When people are sitting in the audience, they're not actually talking about anything. All right. You're talking. And they don't want to listen to a talk. They want to be part of an experience, if possible. So we stay away from the, today we're going to talk about this. Now, if you say it, it's not going to kill you. It's not the big worst thing in the world. Every once in a while, I'll say something that I go, oh, I usually tell people not to say that. I mean, that, that's normal. It happens. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Um, but in general, that's a good uh, philosophy to follow. Okay. Or principle to follow in that case. So... There are a number of different frameworks you can use to organize your information. So let's detail a few of those now, shall we? Good. Okay. Right. Yeah. So listen, so one of the most common and effective frameworks is the numerical framework. The numerical framework is just as it sounds. And let's, let's use some books as examples of these frameworks because most of us have read the same books, but it's less likely that we've seen the same speeches. Mm -hmm. So I can use the books as examples because often the way that you organize a book is very similar to the way that you organize a speech. All right. So a numerical framework is a framework found in Stephen Covey's seven habits of highly effective people, seven habits. Now, Stephen, when of course he was alive, could introduce those to you one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Or he could just teach one or two. He could pull numbers three and four out and just teach those, depending on the environment, depending on the length of time he had, and depending on the needs of the people in that room. So it's very flexible. Yeah. And it does, it does three other things. Number one, it helps you organize the information because part of your job is to cut, 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 cut. Streamline, simplify, clarify. So that numerical framework helps you do that. All these framework, frameworks help you do that for that matter. But it also helps you remember it. Mm -hmm. You just have to remember seven key points and then you break down inside of that. And then you use different frameworks inside of each key point. And we'll get to that in a minute. But it also helps the audience consume the information. Okay. Because you know, often... We, we hear the expression content is king. Right. Yeah. And it makes perfect sense. Content is very important, but there's a lot of people who say similar things, how they say it 
is often what matters most. So consumption is king. Mm. Can they consume it? Because you've got the greatest content in the world right. and you deliver it and they can't understand it or remember it or do anything with it. And it wasn't as a <laughs> right over their head. And if they're bald, it's even faster. <laughs> right over the head. So we want to make sure they can consume it. And that numerical framework is very helpful. Yeah. The chronological framework is also very helpful because it is a step-by-step -step process. Now, notice there's a numerical element to it. You might have three steps, five steps, seven steps. And as a result, people can walk through a process. Yeah. Easier for you to create if what you are teaching or sharing has a sequential element to it. There is a limitation, of course. You can't really pull out steps three and four. Yeah. Because steps three and four won't make sense unless steps one and two are right. already in place. Uh, so that's one thing to consider when it comes to numer uh, uh, chronological frameworks. Another framework is the problem solution framework. Yeah. Uh, a colleague of mine, 25 years or so, wrote a book called Why Parents Love Too Much. And, or when parents love too much, rather. And he, he identified a number of problems that kids had when parents were helicopter parents. They loved their kids so much that they were causing all these problems in them. Yeah. Yeah. So he said, look, here, here are the 10 problems and here are 10 solutions. Straightforward. 10 problems, 10 solutions, 10 problems. So here's, here's problem number one. How are we going to solve this? Here's how we solve it. Straightforward. Another uh, framework that you can use is the compare and contrast framework. Jim Collins used this in Good to Great. Yeah. There are 10 companies. Here are good ones. Here are great ones. Here's what's the same about them, and here's what's different. And mm -hmm. then he presents it that way when he gives the speech as well, and he does it very well. So it's easier for you to consume. And then, finally, there's the, there's the modular framework. Yeah. So there are modules or blocks or parts. Steal the Show, which is, of course, my new brilliant book, is in three parts. Yeah. And uh, I do it that way because I want to organize the information in such a way that the reader can consume it. So they know, oh, this section we're focusing specifically on the performer's mindset. This part we're focusing specifically on the performer's principles and this section is specifically a master class in public speaking technique now yeah. inside has chapters there's three chapters in the first part there are six chapters in the second part and there are eight chapters i think in the third part but the third part is actually half the book yeah so it doesn't, it doesn't mean that each part is weighed equally All right but there's still a deviation a separation between them now what then you do is you use different frameworks in the same speech. So one speech may have one overarching framework and then mm -hmm. you pull different frameworks together. So, so in steal the show, there are those three parts yeah. modules and then each side, each one, I use different frameworks. So part two is the numerical framework. Then in different chapters, I might use different frameworks. I might use a compare and contrast framework in one of the chapters in part three. And then I might move quickly to a problem solution framework. And then the or, or information is delivered in a way that people can continue to consume, but it also adds some contrast to it. So it's not all the same in right. terms of the way the information is organized. So Michael, thank you very much. We're almost out of time here. It's just, so michaelport.com, stealtheshow.com. We've only touched a fraction of the book. Just a tiny fraction. And I've read all six of your books too. So. Oh, that's great. Oh my God. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, like yeah. uh, Mark Wahlberg apologized to the Pope for some of his movies, you know, I, I apologize yeah. uh, to you for some of my books. No, I'm just no. kidding. I just hey. wanted, to get, I wanted to find some way to get that line in there somewhere. I just thought it was yeah. quite <laughs> cute that Mark Wahlberg did that. But yeah, so stealtheshow.com. Uh, there are a lot of bonuses that you can get, uh, templates that will help you craft your content. Uh, I also have a, a whole um, uh, author's guide. So what I did is I took the entire book and then I took out all of the key sections that you use as cheat sheets, essentially, yeah. mm -hmm. so that you can always go back to that. And that's a really massive, uh, really cool thing. 
And people can get that for free when they buy a copy of the book. And if you buy a few more copies, there are other things that you can get as well. So stealtheshow.com is the place to go. And if you like podcasts, go search on Steal the Show uh, podcast with Michael Port. Today, it was number one in new and notable business, number one in education, new and notable, and number one in new and notable uh, society and culture. My mother was very proud about that one. <laughs> Hey, thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ted. I really appreciate it. Okay. We'll talk soon. Thanks.